Welcome to Ask Leo AnswerCast number 159. I'm Leo Notenboom, and I'll be answering questions that people have been asking out at AskLeo.com. Today's answer cast is brought to you by the best of Ask Leo. You know, I've been answering questions on Ask Leo since August of 2003, and in that time, I've answered quite literally thousands of questions. The best of Ask Leo is a separate email subscription where once a week, you'll get exactly what that name implies, a complete article from the Ask Leo archives that I've hand selected as one of the best. These are the most important, the most popular, the most educational, the most helpful, you know, the best. Head out to bestofaskleo.com and sign up for your subscription today. Why do I need a computer? I surf, I shop, I follow auctions, I email, and I download photos from my point-and-shoot camera. I have an online bank account which receives my directly deposited pension check. I also occasionally use OpenOffice to compose and print a letter. That's it. No games, no design programs, nothing. I'm a digital Neanderthal who recently started using a tablet. Will a tablet do what I need without the seemingly never-ending hassles of the Windows operating system? Everything you've described can be done on a tablet. While the demise of the desktop computer has been grossly overstated, in my opinion, scenarios like yours are certainly candidates for just using a tablet. I know several people who do. However, it's my opinion that you may replace the seemingly never-ending hassles of Windows with a completely new set of hassles based on whatever tablet technology you pick up. Tablets will continue to change and be updated. The software on those devices will continue to change and be updated. Most of the hassles people experience with Windows are really nothing more than changes resulting from updates. The same will continue to be true for your tablet as well. It may be at a different rate. It may be more change or less change. But I don't want you to think that you're avoiding one of the most common sources of frustration for people. Change. There's a strong argument that sticking with the devil you know might be appropriate. By that I mean that since you have some experience with Windows and know how to make it do certain things, it could be appropriate to stay there. When hassles come up, you probably have a pretty good sense of what to at least try or where to go for help. If you switch to a tablet, realizing that you'll be starting over. You'll need to learn the tablet's way of doing things, be it Apple's iOS on an iPad or the various Android derivatives. And at, at that, at times, is going to be a bit of a hassle. Finding the appropriate application to do each of the things you want to do will take a little research and patience as well. You might even find the lack of a so-called real keyboard a problem. I know I do. Tablets are fantastic data consumption devices, but I really can't see typing lengthy emails or Ask Leo articles using them. We also have to talk about security. Like you, hackers are becoming more and more interested in the potential vulnerabilities that may be present on tablet and mobile platforms. In many ways, we're still in the early days there. While a number of lessons will have been learned from years of Windows experience, there's still new ground to explore on mobile platforms, both for the hackers as well as the security and anti-malware folks. It's an exciting world, but do realize that it's still young in many ways. Now, I don't want this all to sound like I'm trying to dissuade you from switching to a tablet. As I said, I know several people who have switched to tablets as their primary computing device. For them, it works great. Though most still keep a desktop or a laptop computer around for the few things that are better done with a full screen, a mouse, and a keyboard. You may not need a traditional computer to do everything you want to do. Only you can really say. My point here is more that if you take this kind of leap, I want you to know what to expect. And zero future hassles just isn't one of those things. Here it is, many days after the demise of Windows XP support, and I'm still automatically getting updates. I've allowed them to be installed and nothing untoward has occurred. Do you have any insights into this? Yeah, I do, actually. Several folks have been surprised to see updates still being delivered to their Windows XP machine. I can think of at least three separate reasons that might be happening, and in fact, will keep on happening. 
The first one, of course, is that Internet Explorer was updated at least once recently after support supposedly ended. You may recall that there was a serious bug found in IE shortly after the support date passed. As I thought they might, Microsoft elected to not only fix the bug in IE, but make that fix available via Windows Update for Windows XP users as well. I have no idea whether they'll do something like this again. Believe it or not, it was actually controversial in the press. Several pundits felt that Microsoft should have held a hard line to get more people to abandon XP sooner. But Microsoft erred on the side of security and provided the update. Whether they'll do that again is pretty much anybody's guess. Now, if you're using Microsoft Security Essentials, realize that it gets its database updates via Windows Update. Microsoft committed to keeping that level of update happening well into next year. So this you can certainly expect to continue to see. What's unclear is if the MSRT, the Malicious Software Removal Tool, part of Microsoft's security software, which is updated roughly once a month, will also be included in future updates for XP. Regardless, you will at least see the Microsoft Security Essential updates. Finally, Windows Update, or more correctly, Microsoft Update, can be enabled to update more than just Windows itself. Essentially, the mechanism is extended to cover the other Microsoft software, like perhaps Microsoft Office. Depending on your version of that software, it may still be supported, and as a result, those kind of updates will continue to be provided. Microsoft Update is really just Windows Update checking for more software, so it'll come through the same interface that you're used to seeing. Those updates will continue until support for whatever that product is will end. Now, I don't believe there's really any reason to be concerned at all. The update channel, the source of the updates, the technology used, is very secure. I'm not in the least bit concerned about an unexpected update somehow being malicious in nature. My advice remains to keep it all as up-to-date as possible, and that does include taking whatever updates are offered via Windows or Microsoft Update. Leo, I've got a constant frustration that when I wake my computer after a sleep period, sometimes it comes up fine, other times it cannot reestablish internet connections, or it just doesn't come back up and I end up having to reboot. I've learned to shut down the internet before I sleep. That relieves some of the problems, but I can't figure out why at times it just doesn't come up. A dark screen and no blinking light activity. You know, you'd think after all this time, standby would be a lot more reliable than it is. Sadly, in many cases, it just isn't. I'll explain why that is, what I do, and what steps you might take. Standby is actually kind of special. When you put your computer into standby mode, it's turned off, but not really. Certain parts of the system actually remain powered or partially powered. RAM is the obvious example because it's given enough power so that it doesn't lose whatever is kept in it. Similarly, some hardware devices on your computer also need to handle standby a little differently than a complete shutdown. They need to perhaps put themselves into a low power state that can be recovered from and turned on again quickly. The result is that almost every device needs to at least know about standby, and almost every device on your system needs to do something different when it's told that the system is about to standby or when it recovers. Now, PCs and Windows are awesome in that you can get machines and hardware from hundreds of different manufacturers. The problem, though, is that you can also have machines with hundreds of thousands of different combinations of hardware in them. And each and every one of the drivers for each possible piece of hardware needs to A, play well with all the others, of course, and B, handle standby appropriately as it does so. The fundamental problem with standby, in my opinion, is that the drivers for some of the hardware still aren't handling the special nature of standby properly in 100% of the cases. So, what do I do? Well, I gave up. I never use standby on a PC. Never. Part of that, I realize, is kind of training by my history. Things used to be much worse than they are now, and I learned early on. It hurts when I do this, so don't do this. That has lasted to this day. Standby hurt, so I never used it. Things have certainly gotten a lot better, so perhaps my fear of standby is unwarranted, or at least the magnitude might be. But I still regularly hear stories like yours that make me wonder. 
I'll either use Hibernate or I simply shut the machine down completely. If you want to try and get standby to work more reliably, I suggest two things. One, check for BIOS updates from your system's manufacturer. Much of the power management in a PC is actually performed at the BIOS level, and as a result, it's heavily involved in standby. Second, look for updated drivers for relevant hardware components. In your case, I'd start with a network interface. Check with the manufacturer for updated network drivers. Other hardware that can quickly come into play include video drivers, so updating those is also a good place to start. Now, for the record, I do use standby pretty constantly on my Mac laptop. But when you think about it, it kind of makes sense that Mac would be more stable in this regard. You don't have the option with a Mac of installing all sorts of different hardware that has to learn how to deal with everything. Instead, you have a single vendor with a very small set of hardware options. As a result, the software doesn't have to deal with nearly as many variations and can be more stable. What's the best antivirus program? There's been so much talk on just how each one works and which has the best protection, it's really hard to decide which one to choose. One day you might read a review that says one thing and the next day says another, so it really gets quite confusing. You know, this question comes up all the time. The problem is, is that it's both trivial to answer and it's impossible to answer. There's a strong argument for there being no objective answer at all. It's all about opinion. So, let me tell you mine. There is no best antivirus tool. None. There are several good ones, but none are perfect. And in fact, one that works well for your friend may not work at all for you. There are several problems at play here that make this an almost impossible question to answer. For one thing, as I said, there is no perfect antivirus tool. There just isn't. There is no tool that will catch absolutely every virus. The best you can hope for is one that will catch most, or even most is kind of up for debate. Second, different antivirus tools are written in different ways and actually impact different systems differently. One, for example, might use a lot of memory, but if you have a lot of RAM, it might be an awesome antivirus tool. If you don't have a lot of RAM, well, perhaps it'll slow your system to a crawl. And of course, what it means to have a lot of RAM will vary from machine to machine since different machines will have differing amounts of software installed on them. It'll also vary from antivirus tool to antivirus tool. And of course, the issue may not be RAM. Perhaps there's some other aspect of your system that different tools exercise differently, like perhaps the disk, the CPU, or perhaps even the network connection. As a result, different people with different machines will have different experiences, even with the exact same antivirus tool. It actually gets even weirder. There's no agreement on what is and is not a virus. Oh, sure, the big, hairy, obvious ones are, well, obvious. But how about foistware, spyware, toolbars, things that perhaps you even asked for? Different programs will make different choices, choices that some people think are better than others, choices that other people think are absolute nonsense, choices that make labeling the best almost impossible. So knowing that there is no best antivirus, what's a poor user to do? The single most important thing you can do is just realize that your antivirus tool cannot do everything. It cannot protect you from everything, even if it is this so-called mythical best. Antivirus tools are, and have always been, a part of a much larger picture. That picture includes Yes, a good antivirus tool, a good anti-spyware tool, a firewall, keeping your software, all of it, as up-to-date as possible, securing your router and other hardware, and above all, behaving safely. There is no security tool that will save you from the actions that you are determined to take. And lastly, I will refer you to my article, What Security Software Do You Recommend?, for some specific programs to consider. Managing scanned documents. I've been using Visioneer scanners and paper ports since version one. 
And ever since Nuance took over the software, well, it's been a disaster. Version 11 crashes multiple times for no apparent reason. The worst part is that I can't find any comparable program to replace it that can do everything it can do. I end up living with it, but it's really frustrating. What do you do? My document management approach has actually changed over the years. I used to very carefully and manually scan documents, name files, put them in organized folders, and so on. I don't do anything like that anymore. I've talked before about how I strive to be as paperless as possible. I get documents electronically wherever possible. Bills and receipts and much more come to me in the form of bits rather than on sheets of paper. One of the biggest reasons I do this is that I can do something with bits much more easily than I can with paper. I can back them up. With paper, unless you burn more paper with a copy machine, you have exactly and only one copy. With electronic documents, you can have as many copies as you care to create. I think for most of my electronic documents, about half a dozen machines in something like three or four states would all have to implode simultaneously for me to actually lose something. And those include not just my machines, but some that are owned by some pretty large companies. So what do I do when I actually get paper? Needless to say, I scan it, but it's how I scan it and how I manage my documents after that where things get kind of interesting. I have a Fujitsu ScanSnap scanner. It's an older model, but it's worked solidly for several years now, and it's been worth every penny I paid for it. You can drop a multi-page document into its feeder, push a button, and it'll proceed to scan both sides of the entire document with actually pretty amazing speed. Once it's done so, I typically shred the actual paper document for security. My thinking is that the recycle bin on my street is a lot less secure than my electronic document management techniques. When a document is scanned by my ScanSnap, it automatically runs OCR, Optical Character Recognition. Remember, a scan of a document is really just a picture of that document. There's no text associated with that that a computer can use. OCR is actually a separate process where the computer looks at the picture and tries to determine what the actual text is on that page. The document with the text is then stored. Now, I store almost all of my documents in Evernote. And yes, for security, of course, it has two-factor authentication enabled. I've stopped trying to name or even file any of the scanned documents in Evernote beyond a rudimentary scanned documents folder. So how do I find anything? Well, I use search first, and it's awesome. That's why the documents are OCR'd in the first place. It allows me to search for the term that I think the document I'm looking for contains. Evernote search is blazingly fast, and I quickly cut the list of hundreds or thousands of documents down to just a few, or even just one. If there are more than one, a quick visual scan, and I've got exactly what I'm looking for. But note my overall process. Insert the paper into the scanner, push a button. That's all I need to do. Everything that happens after that is completely automatic until, of course, I need to find a document. Then I just perform a quick search and I have what I need. Now, it gets even better. Evernote has, of course, a mobile app. So that means two things. One, wherever I go, I have almost immediate access to all of my documents in my collection. And two, I can add documents quickly and easily wherever I am. How? By taking a picture. Like I said, a scan is nothing more than a picture of a document. My phone has a camera, so, for example, I take pictures of receipts at restaurants rather than carting home the paper slip. That picture goes directly into Evernote. Evernote then does OCR on uploaded pictures this way, so I can easily find them later with a search. Honestly, the only time I ever have trouble finding documents these days is when they predate my switch to Evernote a few years ago. Then I have to go back to searching my old collection of folders and files. I have a compact Presario that I purchased new in 2006, which came preloaded with Windows XP. Due to the loss of support for Windows XP, I'm looking to purchase a new computer, but with limited funds available at the moment. My question is this, if I do purchase a new CPU from HP, will my current CRT-type monitor still be able to work with the newer computer? 
First of all, be aware the term CPU actually refers to only one chip that's inside the box. We typically refer to that box that I think you call a CPU as the computer. And the external monitor, the monitor. Will the old monitor work? Well, quite probably. It's not an unreasonable scenario at all. I'll review what you need to look for and what might you might be missing out on. The biggest issue you'll actually find is the connector. Your CRT most likely has a VGA style connector to take a VGA analog signal. Newer computers may not have such a beast. Most will have at a minimum the newer DVI digital connector for the digital interface. Some may even have an HDMI interface, which is actually the digital TV interface we're using these days, but which also works really well for computer screens. You'll need to find some kind of adapter. Exactly what adapter you need will depend on the video card in your new machine. If you can, confirm before buying that the video output will be capable of producing VGA. In that case, the computer might actually already come with a small adapter that you need. Connect the adapter to the computer, the cable to the adapter, and you could be good to go. If the computer cannot output VGA signals, then things get interesting. You can look for a DVI to VGA conversion device, but at that point, you know, it might just be cheaper to bite the bullet and get a new monitor. But before you do that, you know, check your TV. Besides taking HDMI, many newer TVs also often support DVI directly. So what I'm saying here is that if you can use your TV as a computer monitor, you may already have everything you need. And for the record, it is also possible your older CRT actually has a DVI connector, which would make all of this moot, of course. It would just work with your new computer. I just don't know how common that is. DVI connections became more popular with the digital signals and newer computers. Now, we also have to talk a little bit about screen resolution. That CRT that you have will have a maximum resolution of some sort. 1024 by 768 is one of the old common ones, but it could be as low as 800 by 600. That's something I think you need to check on. Windows, and perhaps more importantly, many applications are now assuming a larger screen resolution, or they're at least optimized for these larger resolutions. For one example, I have had one of my virtual machine copies of Windows 8 configured to run as a 1280 by 720 resolution. That's the equivalent of HD 720p on most televisions, and actually not a bad resolution to work in at all. However, there are apps, specifically a few Windows 8 tiled apps, that simply will not run because the vertical resolution, that 720, it's too small. So they need something like 768 or better to even come up. So you might want to confirm that your old CRT will be capable of supporting those applications before you make the jump. That's it for another week. If you have a question about your computer, the internet, or technology, head on out to askleo.com to search for an answer or to ask your question. You might hear it answered here on one of my future Ask Leo Answer Casts. Sign up for my newsletter. The weekly Ask Leo newsletter includes more answers and fixes and safety tips, opinions, and even the occasional rant. I always try to make it educational, informative, and hopefully even a little entertaining. I have several books that are available out at askleobooks.com. From backing up to computer maintenance, Ask Leo Books can help. Most of the books include companion online videos accessible only to those who've purchased the books, as well as digital downloads of each book in popular computer and ebook formats. Speaking of backing up, please do it. Seriously, just do it. I plug this every week because it's so important. Nothing can save you from almost any computer disaster like a proper and recent backup. Finally, I do have to let you know that all of my answers are based on my own personal experience and should be used entirely at your own risk. I just don't know you, your abilities, or the specifics of your machine, and those details can make all the difference in the world. The Ask Leo AnswerCast is a production of Ask Leo and is copyright 2014. Thanks for listening. I'm Leo Notenboom, and I'll be back soon with another Ask Leo AnswerCast. Cast.